The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of ONTV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Welcome into to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick. Across from me is Malik Hill. Can I inter- interrupt you really quickly? Yeah, go for it. I think we need to change the intro soon. I know. I've thought about it, actually. It's it's like just now hitting me that this... <laughs> the theme to this show, honestly, should change. Yeah. No, I'm ready. Because those disappointments, we'll get to them later. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good look. No, I've thought about that, too. That it's it's Maybe it's time to upgrade a little bit. Um, so I'll think about it. Um, the other thing that I forgot to do was load up the U of M fight song to play for you. I'm not mad. <laughs> I didn't think about that. I appreciate you taking yeah. the time to think about that because, man, oh, man, I can't believe it still. Yeah. I still can't believe it. You've got U of M in the national championship game. They took down Alabama this past weekend. 27 to 20. It wasn't pretty. It was a little scary at times, but they got it done. Malik, how do you how do you feel? Listen, at at the start of the fourth quarter, like two or three minutes in, I had a text fully loaded to a like a mass group of friends that all went to Michigan that said Michigan was only built to win the Big Ten. Mm. We're not built to win national championships like Ohio State. Right. I had that literally sitting in like the, my draft, <laughs> watching the game, ready to hit send. And then things got weird, even more weird than they already were. Alabama couldn't finish the job. Michigan had one of their best drives of the Harbaugh era. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tie game. They put Jake Thaw in, Jake Thaw, Jake Thaw, it doesn't matter. They, they just, they they bench Samaj Morgan after he muffs a punt. Yeah. And then at the last minute, you put the older walk on in and he muffs a punt too. Which special teams was a nightmare. Got downed at the one yard yes. line. And luckily he was able to to catch it and fall down at the, at the one. But yeah, from that point, from that touchdown on, Michigan just took control Mm -hmm. two Blake Corum runs turned to a touchdown and then they stop Alabama yeah in four tries Mm -hmm. and I've watched the replay of that stop in the celebration after at least 50 times and I'll probably watch it at least 50 more before the game Monday night Michigan is playing in the national championship Mm -hmm. they finally broke through they finally Listen, did what they were supposed two, to do. Two, three years ago, even at times this year, I doubted that this could ever happen. Mm-hmm. That text that I was going to send to the group has been a thought in my head nonstop yeah. throughout mm-hmm. the year that what if they're still just not built for this? Especially on what, the, if, what if they're just built to win the Big Ten? Especially when you get the first play of the game, J.J. McCarthy throws a pick. Yeah. Um, just just a, we- back. a weird in between, not sure of whether to throw it out or throw it to Roman Wilson. So he throws in between yeah. where an Alabama player is, and luckily he was standing out of bounds. Mm. Michigan's defense, man, they were awesome. They were locked in. They were awesome. The five sacks in the first half. I haven't seen that front line. They've been re- very good all season. They were elite mm. against Alabama. They were better on offensive and defensive line. Now, Alabama took over in the third quarter and their line kind of got it going. Yeah. But it wasn't close for the most part. Michigan was better in the trenches. And they were the better team overall, really. Yeah. If you wipe away the special teams' mistakes, Michigan probably wins this game by at least like two touchdowns in regulation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go to overtime. But Michigan didn't make it easy on themselves. Mm Mm-hmm. But they, they got just enough from Blake Corum, who 
I, he cemented himself as a Michigan legend, maybe the best running back in Michigan history. He broke the record for rushing touchdowns mm-hmm. in program history. That touchdown run in overtime was some, was beautiful to watch. Mm-hmm. The jump cut at the line, the two cuts afterwards, and breaking the tackles going into the end zone. Yeah, that run like summed up the type of running back he's been. And he had his a, four years at Michigan. He had a fairly slow game yeah. up until the fourth quarter in overtime. He, like he he had like a thirty yard run in the first quarter. He had a few like eight nine chunk yard run, uh, chunks in the second and third. But yeah, that that last drive, that fourth and two on their own thirty, when he rolls out and catches that pass and takes it like forty yards. Mm-hmm. They they just they made plays when they needed to. Yeah. He and hit I, that play. I think you gotta give a lot of credit to Sharon Moore too. Both coordinators. Like Sharon Moore and Jesse Jesse Mentor did everything that I said he needed to do. Mm-hmm. He confused and frustrated Jalen Milrow. Yeah. And Sharon Moore, even though that third quarter Yeah. Well those are the times where Sharon Moore frustrates me. Yeah. Because the first half was creativity mm-hmm. and taking advantage of of mismatches. The crossing routes were wide open almost like every drive in the first half. And Alabama was just having problems. Yeah. And then all of a sudden in the fourth quarter again, he was drawing up stuff that yeah, was but, just letting them march down the field. So Yeah, and even though J.J. missed some passes, mm-hmm. he didn't have the cleanest game, the stat line is still clean. No, no turnovers. He hit passes when he needed to hit them. He threw the touchdown pass to Blake Corum. He threw the touchdown pass to Tyler Morris, mm-hmm. who caught that crossing route and took it like 30-something yards and outran Alabama defensive players. How about that ACC speed? <laughs> and I think even if that ball doesn't get tipped, it's still a completion of Roman Wilson. He put so much juice on that throw, that post yeah. route that Roman Wilson ran, that when it got tipped by the linebacker, it was still a perfect spiral. Yeah. It, like had to, it, it, it made, just changed the trajectory and went up higher. It went, yeah, Roman had to make a play on that ball. So yeah. And it he, probably would have been a cleaner pass. Another a legendary Michigan football play in history, mm-hmm. him going up and making that catch and then making a cut and getting like six or seven more yards. Yeah. Every, all of our most important players stepped up mm-hmm. when they needed to. Right. And they just they made it happen. Mm-hmm. I... I... I, I'm I'm out of I'm out of words. Yeah, they reacting also, to the fact that they actually did it again. They they also kind of put all the haters to rest, where everybody was like, "Oh well, you can't beat Nick Saban in a playoff game." Harbaugh completely outcoached him. Yeah, and that's what a lot of people are taking away from this game is that Nick Saban got outcoached for once. It doesn't happen very and often. Part of it is the coordinator advantage because yeah. Jesse Minner versus um, oh my God, his name is escaping me right now. Former Notre Dame quarterback, former Notre Dame offensive coordinator for a season, came Tommy Reese mm. came over to Alabama this season, did a solid job, not that great for Alabama fans, and Jesse Minter just yeah, he coached circles around him. Yeah, Jalen Milrow could never get fully comfortable. He could never hit those deep shots that he loves hitting. And I I just that defense was I loved it. Mm-hmm. I loved how aggressive they were. They played clean, no targetings, nothing crazy. Just really good high level defense. Yeah. I will say Jalen Milrow, I think I think his uh future is pretty bright. He could be fun. It could be. Alabama has a lot of things to fix though. Yeah. And one of those things I don't know if you saw there's a clip that somebody put out to uh it was today or yesterday. The first play of the season for Jalen Milrow where he scored was a skipped uh, snap to him that he had to drop down and pick up off the ground yeah. and take 30 yards for a rushing touchdown. Mm-hmm. So the season started with a messed up snap. Yeah. And in the most important game of the season, several messed up snaps. Yeah. And clear miscommunication and anger between the center and Jalen Miller. Mm-hmm. And the last play of the game in overtime, a low snap. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure what they do to figure that one out. That was, that was rough. Mm-hmm. Um, so now U of M sitting in the national title game, and they will be playing Washington, who defeated Texas in the Sugar Bowl after they almost blew it late in the game. Because um, at first, Washington looked like they were going to run away with the game, I thought, personally. 
Uh, Michael Penix was on point. Um, Quinn Ewers was struggling quite a bit. It seemed can like I, Texas can I stop in you general. for a second? Yeah. You just understated that Jalen, I mean, the uh, Michael Penix performance. <laughs> I know, but. On, on point doesn't even describe. Yeah. What he might have cemented himself as a top five pick in the NFL draft. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about perfection? Yeah. And hitting receivers like that are somewhat mm-hmm. tightly covered right in the hands. Like, yeah. I. Besides Michael Vick, I don't think I've seen a prettier lefty release besides his. Yeah. And he, I, I don't understand how he part. It almost every pass he throws, he knows exactly how to throw it mm-hmm. and where to put it. Yeah, it, it was it was something. Yeah. And like like you said, there's there was multiple times, and I'm trying to remember though. There was one. I can't remember if it, if he threw it to Polk or a Dunsey, but was it a touchdown or the one on the sideline? Yeah, there's a sideline. One. The one on the sideline, I think it was to. It wasn't. Uh, I think it was Romo Dunze. Yeah. The one over the it shoulder. It was like yeah. Or bucket drop. Uh, listen, <laughs> there are NFL quarterbacks that can't make that throw. Yeah. Like it. It was. It was incredible watching. Mm-hmm. It was like the Joe Burrow LSU playoff run. Yeah. Where everything was on time, everything was in the bucket. There were almost no flaws right. from that LSU offense in that playoff, and almost for the whole season, let alone. Yeah. But yeah, and that that performance against Texas, they ba- they barely made any mistakes. Yeah. Do you think uh, Michael Penix is upset about losing the Heisman to Jaden Daniels? He's probably gotten over it, but the rest of the country reacting to it probably makes up for whatever he feels. Yeah. Because people are starting to realize he probably got robbed. Yeah. I think it's unfortunate. I think Jaden Daniels is a great prospect. I just don't know if he's fully shown his potential just yet. And uh, I feel like we've seen Michael Penix – at his best. So I don't know. It was unfortunate. But um that late night game was fun. I, it was a lot of scoring like I think we expected. Um and Texas finally kind of figured it out towards the end. Uh they had a chance to uh pull off the upset, but it just didn't happen. I I think there there was some pressure in uh Quinn Ewers' face on that last throw. Mm-hmm. And he had to throw up kind of a lob. Yeah, he did. That receiver was like wide open, and mm-hmm. like near the front of the end zone. If Quinn Ewers was able to throw a bullet pass, it would have like hit him in his chest, yeah, or right in his face. Mm-hmm. But that lob made it so the Washington DB could knock it out of his hands. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Washington did just enough and built enough ground in the first half, yeah, to yeah get away in the end. Mm-hmm. Oh, the one thing I wanted to go back to really quick on Michigan Alabama, were you terrified? On that final drive when Alabama, and they kept showing his their kicker on the sideline, talking about he's the best kicker in the nation, blah, 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 blah. Did that make you nervous? You're talking about Alabama's kicker? Yeah. On which drive do you mean? The final drive. Like, before, like, when... Uh, like, Michigan, after Michigan scored? Yeah. Or when it was 2020? So, like, Alabama had the... Yeah, at after 2020, when Alabama had the chance to go down and hit the game-winning field goal. But Michigan got the stops. And they got sacks. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot. I forgot. Because Alabama had a chance. To I win forgot the game. it. I forgot after they tied it. Michigan still had to get a stop. Yeah. For some reason in my mind, I remember it being before they scored the twenty. No, it was after. Yeah. And they kept showing, uh, what's his name, Reichard or something. I mean, by by the time after they made like the first down stop, mm-hmm. I could tell the defense was still in the zone. Yeah. So like I wasn't. I was still nervous because obviously Alabama still could have done something. Mm-hmm. But after that first down stop, I calmed down a little. Realized the defense was still locked in. They made another play. Then I was like, Jalen Milrow isn't about to <laughs> do something yeah. incredible on this third down. Right. Like, this situation is really tight. Their offense has been up and down all game. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I just thought it was crazy because I was like, oh, man. Of course, Michigan, in this weird scenario, they're going to face one of the best kickers. And it was it was under a minute, too. And Alabama's offense isn't known for, like, yeah those quick drives. Right. But he's he's one of the few college kickers that's like consistently fifty plus. So I don't know. I was worried about it. But if I'm, they got there, I would have been terrified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Michigan's defense, yes, again stepped up. So now, Michigan, Washington, national championship. How do you feel about this game? I'm not sugarcoating anything. <laughs> I'm I'm going like ten percent logic and like ninety percent fan. Mm-hmm. I, I'm taking Michigan. I just I want it more than anything. Yeah, I I want them <laughs> to finally do this 
and shut everybody up mm-hmm. and just it, it's it's my dream come true for this to happen. Go That's to, why I'm picking Michigan. Go to a conclusion. I'm that, picking Michigan because go blue. I'm picking Michigan because I bleed maize and blue from a from an actual from an actual like analytical standpoint. Yeah. Jesse Minter. The, I thought his game plan against Alabama was going to be the biggest ever. Trying to contain Michael Penix is going to be hard. Mm-hmm. Now, Michael Penix did have a stretch during the season where he was kind of average. Yeah. They played close to Arizona. They played close to Oregon State. Now, the weather was a factor in that, but it was still close. Yeah. And they played close to their rival, uh, Washington State. Each of those games, Michael Penix made three or four throws like he always has that set the game apart and just made a few, just enough big plays to win the game. Yeah. Jesse Minter has to figure out how to stop their deep passing game because mm-hmm. nobody's figured out how to completely stop it. Yeah. Now, I think Michigan can score on Washington's defense. Many teams have shown that they can. Right. And I have confidence that Sharon Moore still has some stuff up his sleeve. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully he calls that uh, flea flicker at the right time in this game yeah. because – it was wide open. Mm-hmm. It was a wide open pass, but they sent a blitz at the right time. Alabama Alabama sent a blitz at the right time, and Blake Corum didn't have time to get the ball back to JJ McCarthy cleanly. Right. So I have confidence Sharon Moore can get points on the Washington defense, even though they're good and they play physical. Yeah. But this is yeah this is the game of Jesse Minter's life. I think uh, Michigan's offense might run smoother. They might be able to run the ball more. We saw Texas take some big gashes yeah. into Washington's defense on the ground. Um, what's their running back? C.J. Baxter? Is yeah, that C.J. Baxter and Jaden Blue the backup. Yeah, they both like had some big chunk plays. So yeah. I think Blake Corum should be probably – he could have a better game than he did against Alabama. Um, Yeah, and I, the other thing too I think that Michigan did good, and it's not necessarily a one-to-one comparison, but they did really good against Jermaine Burton of Alabama. Will Johnson. Best corner in college football. Yeah, he's and he's only a sophomore. Played really good. Um, now, granted, again, Washington they got three NFL receivers. Their weapons are a little different. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's a good sign, I think, going into yeah. that game. I have bit. confidence that Will Johnson will do a good job against Romo Dunze, mm-hmm. who I assume that'll be his starting right. main matchup. But yeah, those other two guys, it, it's it's going to be really tough. Like Josh Wallace. Yeah. Has had a very good season for Michigan. He's going to have to play the best game of his life. Mm-hmm. Mike Sainer still is going to have to continue to play at a high level. And the safeties, Rod Moore, I just, he broke up a huge deep, deep ball that mm-hmm. Alabama tried to hit in the third quarter, I believe. I trust him. Makari Page, he's going to have to play great in coverage. They're, they're all just going to have to ball out. Yeah. Like there's there's no mincing words, there's no extra like complicated thing to it. And it's definitely going to have to be one at the line of scrimmage again because that defensive yeah. line is going to have to get pressure because if you don't get pressure on Michael Penix, eventually he's going to tear you apart. Exactly. So that's kind of you know one of those scenarios where the defensive line needs to help out the DBs, basically. Yeah, they're, they're going to have to watch film of those games where Michael Penix didn't just straight up ball out and see what those defenses did to like slow down the passing game. Mm-hmm. Because there are times where Washington's offense can go three and out, three and out, three and out, and things can slow down and the confidence of the offense kind of drops. Right. Because it becomes so pass heavy. And that's something that Michigan's really good at. Like we talked about before, if they get a lead, they run the ball, they slow the game down, they kind of make it boring on you. You get out of the rhythm, and that's what you'd need to do against Washington. Yeah, that that will be the <laughs> biggest goal, trying to knock Michael Penix off his rhythm. And doing that after the game he just had, it's going to be hard. Mm-hmm. It's going to be so hard. He's a high-level NFL prospect that can make every throw accurately and on time, mm-hmm. and his confidence is at an all-time high. Yep. They might have to start the game out like they did against Alabama, where the pressure is in his face yeah, nonstop. He can't get the ball out on time, and things get kind of get knocked off. Mm-hmm. The game plan has to get switched up a little. Yeah. And a, uh, an advantage for 
Michigan, even though it is kind of unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Uh, Washington's running back got banged up. Yeah. Dylan Johnson. Mm-hmm. So who knows how much he's going to play. Yeah. The running game wasn't awesome to start with right. in that game, but yeah, have, not having your starter is going to hurt. And I think one of their DBs got hurt too. So, yeah. It's it's a it's a really interesting matchup, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two different styles, two completely different teams from different coasts. Yep. And there's no SEC. That are now going to be joining forces in the big conglomerate. Yeah. This is huge for the Big Ten. This is huge. Yeah. Um, do you have a prediction? I I said it to start it. I'm <laughs> I'm taking Michigan. Yeah, but you have a score prediction. A score? Huh. I don't know. I I think Michigan gets over 30. Okay. I will go 35-24 Michigan. Okay. Yeah. I think Michael Penix still hits. He hit two touchdowns in the last game. I I still think there's a good chance he hits two in this one. Mm Mm-hmm. But it could be like in the third or fourth quarter when Michigan already has some control. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really think Michigan needs to come out and set that, send some pressure after Michael Penix and get things thrown off. Mm-hmm. Because if he starts out hot, unless Will Johnson can make a few picks or the, yeah, you, you got to get some, like, force some turnover somehow. Yeah. If he starts out hot, it it would be much better to for him to start him out slow. Mm-hmm. And try to like make him st- start forcing things, like taking shots that he doesn't need to take. Yeah. So, yeah, thirty-five, twenty-four, Michigan. Okay. Um, one final thing on Michigan. Did you see their next year's schedule? Yeah. It's gonna Listen, be crazy. They got Texas Week Two. Mm-hmm. They got Oregon and USC at home. They go to Washington without Michael Penix. Yes. <laughs> they have Will Rogers coming from Mississippi I mean, State. I'm uh, still a good passer. I mean, but think about it. Luckily, yeah. they they'll play USC without Caleb Williams. Exactly. Oregon, Oregon without, without Bonin. But they they Dylan Gabriel. So I know they're yeah. And these teams, I, I mean, big schools like this are going to reload all the time. But the way yeah. those guys were towards the end, terrifying. it's it's very helpful that you have Texas, USC, and Oregon all in Ann Arbor. Yeah, that helps. Mm-hmm. So it's still this may be the toughest Michigan schedule, mm-hmm. one of the toughest in school history. Yeah, and when you're at this level. It is what it is. Yeah. Those that those types of schedules are going to happen every now and then. Mm-hmm. And people that don't like Michigan have been begging for this for a long time. Yeah. They hate the fact that Michigan hasn't scheduled any even like pretty good first three game like schedules yep. in a long time. Even me. I'm one of those yeah. people. I get tired so, of it. Listen, America's getting what they want. Yeah. And even opening up with Fresno State isn't easy. <laughs> Right. Fresno State runs really good offense, and they're an experienced bunch. Mm-hmm. So that's not even easy. Right. Yeah, especially as, as like smaller conference schools yeah. go. They're not one to mess around yeah, with. They, they beat Purdue at Purdue mm-hmm. to open the season this year. Yeah. yeah. If, if you had to predict a score, what would you say? Um, I think you're kind of in the right line. I think it might be... What did you say? 35 24? I said 35 24. I'm thinking more. This it it could be something even closer, like 35 31. I know. Where like Michael Penix starts slow and yeah. he could start slow and take off or start good and Michigan makes adjustments. Yeah. Either way. My but I think Michigan's defense is good enough to slow him down for at least a quarter and a half. Yeah. My thought is like 30. I want to say 30-27. Like, it might be just end up being close. Michigan wins by a field goal. Something like that. Or it could be the same scenario where, like, it's 30-20 to 20 or something. Washington gets a late touchdown just before the end, so it makes yeah. it look closer. That's where my thought process is. But I, I could see it being even closer to, like, a shootout kind of deal, which is it's kind possible. of crazy. But Yeah, and my, my 35-24 score is kind of guided by – the team of destiny thing. Yeah. For me being a Michigan fan where if this is, if like this has to be the time, like the fact that they finally got over the, the semifinal hump mm-hmm. and beat Nick Saban in Alabama, 
what besides this, like what other time would it be? Yep. Especially this when is the time where Michigan puts it together for like a whole game. They're going to lose JJ. They're going to lose Blake Corum. They might lose Jim Harbaugh. A lot of your your defense is made up of a lot of seniors. Your O-line is several seniors. Yeah. You have draft picks all over this team mm-hmm. in terms of starters. Yeah. Oh, actually, that was the other one thing that I thought of before we wrap up or we go to the next thing. Um, does the way that this season ended make you feel more confident about Michigan going forward with potentially without Jim Harbaugh? The way that Sharon Moore picked up the team during the suspension and stuff like that. I would say it does because if when a lot of people think it's when Jim Harbaugh leaves, I am confident that they will hire Sharon Moore Mm -hmm. and that he will keep the train rolling as it is. Now, does that mean they're still going to be a well-oiled machine where every guy they bring in on defense and in the trenches, they all develop at a very high level and you get the right four star guys. And I don't know if it's all going to literally hit exactly like it has right in the past four to five years. Yeah. Cause the recruiting it's like, it's might like, change a little it's bit. It's like a long time for them to get to what this version of Michigan football is. Right. It took a while, mm-hmm. but I am confident they will stay at, at baseline, a respectable version. Mm-hmm. of Michigan football, <clears throat> well-coached, not making many mistakes, led by the trenches, physical, high-level run game, and I guess basically the stereotype of Michigan football, <laughs> which they they played a like improved, higher-grade version of Michigan football yeah. to get them where they are right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they took the old-school script, and they just added to it, right. which I guess was the answer all along. Mm-hmm. And I think Sharon Moore could, could could continue that. Yeah. All right. So more positive news from over the weekend. The Pistons are no longer a laughing stock, per se. They we can, did it. We can they get our did. wings from Wingstop. <laughs> Listen, I'm sorry to every Wingstop worker in Detroit. Yeah. That had to work that Saturday night because my God. Yeah. Craziness. Um. So the Pistons, they finally won. After losing 28 straight games, if they would have lost that game, that would have been the worst losing streak in sports history since, like, the 50s or something like that. Baseball, hockey, basketball, it doesn't matter. It would have been the worst of all time, basically. Um, But they got the win against the Raptors, 129-127. to We just happened to be watching the Lions game together when this was going on, and... From what we were, we were watching the ESPN game cast, and I usually don't do that. Yeah, but which, which doesn't actually show the game. No, but it, but it, it, it follows updates. the play. Yeah, it follows the play by play. Yeah, of what's happening, and it stays pretty up to date. So you're almost right on regular time. And the Pistons were up like ten or something with like two minutes left. They yeah. were up by ten, and or two and change or whatever. From everything that we saw and read into, they definitely tried to lose the game. They had some late turnovers where they couldn't get the ball in. I saw bounds. several posts on Twitter, X, Twitter, yeah, of people saying the Pistons are look like they've never tried inbounding the basketball before. Yeah, so yeah, thing things got scary. Mm-hmm. It seemed like, and Scotty Barnes was having a pretty rough game for the most part. Well, he decided to have like twelve points in the final quarter. Yeah, um, and him, Siaka, man, Dennis Schroeder all yeah. went off in the second half. They scored over forty points in the last two quarters. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty crazy, um, but they got it done. They won 129 to 127, and then they started off the new year just like they did the rest of the year. They got blown out by the Rockets the other night. So yeah. right back onto a losing streak, but hey, they you know they got rid of the, the big losing streak. So hopefully they can uh, figure something out, make some trades. and uh, Well, they did make a trade. Do something. But I guess we'll talk about that at another time. They didn't make a trade. I thought you, I thought you made the Raptors. Oh, I, no. I, w- I was talking about the Pistons. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you meant the Raptors. No, no, no. The, the Raptors did make a trade. I guess we yeah. can talk about it real quick. The The Raptors finally traded OG Ananobi, who's been somebody, somebody's dream yeah, He's been in trade for talks for, with half the league for the past two years. Yeah, everybody wants him. The Knicks finally said, let's have him. Now, the Knicks ended up trading R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel Quickly 
And it's it's hilarious that quickly is like the main thing that Knicks fans are, are yeah. saddest about. Which because sucks for RJ Barrett. Because he's like but, a bench come off the bench fire guy. Yeah. Um, which a lot of teams need and want. Um, so I think this immediately makes the Raptors a good team again. Yeah. The the Knicks actually won their first game with OJ and OB mm-hmm. and Precious Achua. Yeah. Malachi Flynn, the most important person in the trade. Yeah. My guy from San Diego State. Yeah. I think he still has a nagging injury, so he didn't play. But yeah, the Knicks won their first game. Yeah, with OG and but Precious they had to get thirty nine from Julius Randall. So it is what it is. OG played good. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think the Raptors definitely won the trade. Yeah, the the Knicks wanted defense mm-hmm. and a more trusted shooter in OG and Anobi. So yeah, I think they're gonna get that. And now but, I wonder, maybe this keeps Pascal Siakam on the on the Raptors for another season. He's still getting traded at some. point. You think so? He won't be a Raptor forever. Because he's a free agent, right? I think he's he a free agent after this yes. year. So they might just hold on to him. True. That, I forgot about that. Um, maybe let him walk, I guess. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. But if they think that R.J. Barrett and Manuel quickly are enough to turn their team around a little bit, maybe there's a chance. Yeah, well, back to the Pistons. Yeah. To- Kevin Knox had a great game. <sighs> he missed a dunk, though. He did. But he also dunked on Jakob Pertl. Yeah. Hey, Cunningham didn't start well. Finished strong. Yep. Ended up with 30. Yeah. Hit, hit free throws. Got to the free throw line. Hit his free throws. Jaden Ivey. Who would have guessed? The more you play Jade, Joey, who would have guessed that uh, the less you play Killian Hayes and the more you play Jaden Ivey, yeah. what do you think happens, Joey? Uh, Jaden Ivey plays better. Hey, man. What, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Shouts out to Monty Williams and that garbage organization. Mm-hmm. But the Pistons got to win. The young guys look good. Jalen Duran played well. Mm-hmm. Good for the Pistons. Yeah. Uh, they're still looking for their, their four spot uh, because Beef Stew is out right now. They've been playing Bogey and Kevin Knox, which just sounds awful. I um, mean, it, it's more shooting in the lineup, so it helps, yeah. I guess. The nice thing, though, too, is that Jay Ivey did, again, follow up uh, with another good game against Houston. He had 19 points, six uh, rebounds. So he's... Hopefully, back on track. Yeah. Um, the bench, it's kind of a mess. Kind of a mess. Alec Burks has his games here and there. He but, shoots well at home and doesn't on the road. Yeah. That's pretty much what I've seen from Alec Burks. Mm-hmm. So, Pistons, their schedule is no fun coming up. They're going to play the Jazz again, but I think they're going to be fully healthy. Then they're going to play the Warriors, Nuggets, Kings. Good luck. Watch them beat one of them. But they do get the Spurs... January 10th. The one everybody's waiting for. So maybe there's a chance, but um, not looking great. So hopefully, again, hopefully the Pistons make a trade, get something done, um, and finish the season okay. At this point, the goal is to not be the worst team in NBA history. They yeah. still, they could go on three or four two-game win streaks, mm-hmm. and they wouldn't be the worst team in NBA history. Get to like, 13 or 14 wins. Yeah, that would be and nice. And you're not the worst. Yeah. 10 that'd more be, wins. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> All right. And then because the Pistons win, we had to sacrifice a Lions win on Saturday night. Everybody's it, the, it's not the Pistons. <laughs> That's know. not who did it. <laughs> I know. Everybody's heard about it. We're not going to go on and on and on and on. We're going to try to preview more playoff implication stuff, things like that. But... We were watching the Lions game along with my brother, and we were so hyped about the Taylor Ducker two point conversion. And the thing you the, for the, about ten seconds, I was gonna say it looked like the game was about. It was the craziest much over. thing is how long it took yeah. for them to conspire and call and throw the flag that we had so much time to be like joyous and happy we, we had done like a circle around the living room yeah we had all high-fived each other and then we looked up and there was like that something stupid going on yellow box <laughs> on the tv yeah. screen that and you then, hate to see and then joe buck was like oh wait a minute yeah and then it was like oh, okay what's happening and then they immediately call ineligible player downfield or illegal touching that's yeah. what the official said um and the whole you know taylor decker didn't report now the NFL put out a video today about uh, the whole situation saying that we need players to 
show that they're reporting and blah, blah, blah. It's a bunch of BS. The video is awful because it shows Taylor Decker reporting yes. to the officials. It shows Jared Goff pushing Taylor Decker mm-hmm. and saying, go over there. Yeah. Taylor Decker goes up to him, says something. The ref looks at him, mm-hmm. says something also, and walks away. Yeah. And on this video that the NFL put out, they have this terrible voiceover going on, explaining the rules about how reporting works, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't make sense. It's awful. It's a bad look. I think people forget, or maybe the NFL forgot, the 2024 draft is in Detroit. Yeah. Good luck with that. (laughs) Good luck with that. It's going to be huge. It'll be the most beautiful mess of booze after everything. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. It would be even better if it, like, rained <laughs> or uh, snowed in April. That would be even yeah, better. something. But uh, you know what I think the worst part of it is? Mm-hmm. The fact that Dan Campbell told them beforehand yeah. that this is something that we might do. Mm-hmm. He pretty much confirmed it with the officials yeah. of what it was going to be. Mm-hmm. So, in my opinion, even if they tried to pull a fast one, even I, I don't even if it wasn't reported correctly, mm-hmm. the Lions have practiced this. Yeah, Dan Campbell told them what they were doing. Everybody on the field did what they were taught, what they thought was right. Yeah, and Dan Campbell told the refs, "This is what we're going to do." Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a bad look. Um, my biggest problem with it all, okay, Brad Allen saw that Dan Skipper had been reporting most of the game or a couple times during the game. So then on this final play, he sees Dan Skipper running in, assumes, which we know we can't assume because you know what that does, um, he assumes that Dan Skipper is going to be the guy that's eligible. He's not. So he makes a mistake, a big mistake, and – Disregards Taylor Decker, basically. My biggest problem. That is problem, the mistake. Yeah. That. I don't think everybody, NFL fans understand how insane this is. Mm-hmm. But it, the NFL covering themselves. Yeah. Clearly, they just. That's my biggest problem. Brad Allen stuck to his guns after the game, saying he made the correct call, that Skipper was uh, reported as eligible. He wasn't. Blah, blah, blah. Just own up to your mistake. I don't know if people remember. I'm sure they do because it's a infamous in Detroit. Jim Joyce made an incorrect call on Armando Galarraga. Perfect game. He called an out. What a callback. When it I love this. <laughs> was not an out. That man got death threats. That man was basically exiled from the MLB. And he was man enough to come back up to the podium, tears in his eyes, saying he made the incorrect call. And that was for an individual accolade. Now, perfect games like never happen. It's a huge deal. But it was for an individual. This is for a whole team fighting for a potential number one seed, most likely being able to lock up the two seed in what is one of their best seasons since 1993 or whatever. Just own up to the mistake. That's all we want. To keep doubling down and saying, oh, this is how it was, when all the evidence around it clearly shows Taylor Decker reporting, clearly shows Jared Goff showing him go report. Dan Skipper literally just running, not doing anything with his hands because you're supposed to do this as the reporting signal. And you can even see Taylor Decker kind of has like his hands right here. To not own up to it is the most frustrating part, I think. The NFL is going to bury it. Yeah. And Lions that, fans, That's all they're going to do. And Lions fans won't let it happen. Oh, this is not at all. <laughs> For the rest of time, this will be remembered in Detroit. Yeah. So now, the only thing that has me fired up is the script that I guess this could cause. Because the Lions are now basically locked into the three seed. There's some crazy scenarios they could get back into the second seed. And there's some other crazy scenarios of who they could play. They're going to play Minnesota the last game of the season. Doesn't fully matter, but I want them to just destroy the Vikings. Let's just go out with a bang, show that we're mad. Take your anger out on the Vikings. Right. 
And that will lead to us playing most likely the, the two most uh, likely scenarios are we're going to play the Rams in the first round or the Packers. Both have huge storylines. I want the Rams for that storyline. The Lions getting over their demons a couple weeks after Michigan got over their demons. The Lions get over the Stafford era, get over the big trade, move on. Then we play Dallas at Dallas again. And I want Detroit fans to show Take up over. even more. Take over AT&T Stadium. <laughs> and just go crazy. Yeah. And we beat Dallas at Dallas the way it was supposed to happen. Um, that would be sweet. We make it to the NFC title game. At that point, again, I would love to beat the 49ers or whoever's there. But at that point, I don't really care. We did what we were supposed to do this season. Listen, it it sucks to go back to this. But honestly, if Derek Barnes wasn't afraid to get a roughing the passer penalty, yeah, I don't think any none of this probably happens. Yeah. That's what it, it seems like in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Derek Barnes was afraid to go head on at Dak Prescott. Yeah. Because he could end up I don't know, 15 yard penalty or something. Because mm-hmm. the defense played really good other than that. But you, you got to hit the quarterback, man. Yeah. Like, kudos to him to re- for rebounding after that because mm-hmm. he had a really good game after that huge mistake. Yeah. But that was one of the big, most glaring mistakes that just seemed terrible yeah. and dumb in the moment. The other one was not kicking the field goal. Uh, what is That was before the half or something like that. Yeah. Um, they got the turnover. They drove down the field, couldn't get in the end zone, decided to go for it on fourth. That's one of those few times where I would have just liked to take the points so you get something out of that turnover. Didn't do it. I love going for two at the end of the game. I think that was the right call. Um, a lot of people disagreed with when they got the penalty that they should have just kicked the extra point. I'm okay with staying aggressive. So I, under, am I I kind of understand both sides, I guess. Luckily, Micah Parsons got an offsides, so we got a third play. The third play was very disappointing, too. Jared Goff definitely missed. If he hit, yeah, if he hit James Mitchell, it's probably, probably yep. a conversion. And we wouldn't be talking about it. Yeah. And so that's where you always say, yes, there's more than one scenario that you, know, you could have gotten the win, should have gotten the win. The problem was just the way that that ended, that scenario that, you know, it's not even like the team is making the mistake. It's the refs making the mistake. You would rather like Jared Goff overthrows Taylor Decker and they miss and they lose off that. Then you're you're disappointed, but you're not just outwardly upset at a ref yeah. for messing it up, if that makes sense. So, Lions, hopefully this fuels the fire um, and gets them going. So, we'll see. There's a lot of playoff implications implications going into this week 18 um we were looking at it before the uh we started the podcast the afc is crazy the bottom of the nfc it's a little bit crazy but i don't think the nfc has those powerhouse teams at the bottom i don't think it's as deep necessarily as what the afc could be and how they're shaping up um because the a the nfc south is really bad it's going to be Tampa Bay or New Orleans who get in. And then the wild card spot is basically between Green Bay and Seattle. There's a couple random scenarios that could happen where uh, Minnesota still makes it in or New Orleans or even Atlanta. Atlanta has the lowest odds, but there's a chance. Nobody wants that. Yeah. Literally no one. Mm-hmm. I don't even think Falcons fans want that. Yeah. They they want this quarterback situation to be done. Like mm-hmm. The other problem, too, with this Dallas win is it puts Dallas ahead of Philly in the NFC East. And if they win the division, we've already shown they're, what, 15-0, and 16-0 and at home in the last two years or whatever. So to give them home field advantage basically throughout the playoffs until the NFC Championship game, potentially, really just puts an even bigger damper on it, especially after they did their Ring of Honor that night, Cowboys being America's team. Listen, it's just... Can, can we just... The Lions and Cowboys. I, the Lions and Cowboys history. I hate the Cowboys. So, listen. I respect uh, Jimmy Johnson. Mm-hmm. He's one of the few 
things about the Cowboys throughout their history I respect. Yeah. Because of what he did at Miami and then immediately jumped to the NFL and just started a dynasty. Mm-hmm. They're not doing this for any other franchise in the, in the NFL. Yeah. Why Why the Cowboys? Why? Why do you have to make them so special? Why does this have to be a spectacle? Why? Yeah. The other part, Other people's ring of honors aren't televised like this. Yeah. The other part, too, is Philadelphia losing. They lost to the Cardinals. Worst loss of the season. Which... Worst loss of the which season. Which almost makes it worse because now the cow. So then, because the Eagles lost, the winner of Cowboys and Lions basically sets who can get the second seed. Like, if the Lions would have won that game, gotten the win, they would almost surefire be... I think they're, they would be locked in to the number two seed because Philly lost. Yeah. And now it's a fight for the two seed where for the Lions to get the two seed, Philly and Dallas have to lose. Something like that, I believe. And then, um, well, are that, although right now they're showing... Well, yeah, they would have... I don't remember the scenario. But basically, the Lions have like the hardest odds or something like that. And now Dallas gets a cakewalk matchup against Washington. So Detroit fans, we're going to be big Washington Commanders fans this weekend, um, just by the random chance. Yeah, it seems, it almost seems impossible that the Commanders win this game, yeah. unless like Trey Lance starts and he's so rusty that he just can't get it going. Mm-hmm. If Dak Prescott is playing, that defense is going to do what they do. Micah Parsons is too dangerous. Right. They're beating the Commanders. Yeah. So yeah, they'd have to pull off a miracle. Maybe if Jacoby Brissett is healthy. Him out dueling Dak Prescott would put a smile on my face. He it definitely would. Because he didn't play last week uh, against the 49ers. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe Dak throws like three picks. Yeah. He has one of those games. This is just hoping and praying. <laughs> right. Odds are it doesn't happen, but yeah, anything is possible. Because it's, uh, I guess it is at, Dow- or at Washington, so eh, yeah. there's a chance, but not very likely. Yeah. Also, before we move on from the Lions, I want to say, Kudos to Hutch for having his best game of the season against the Cowboys. Mm-hmm. Three, Three sacks. Three big-time sacks that showed he can get there, and it's kind of still frustrating that it took this long. Mm-hmm. But it's obvious that he has the talent to do this. Yeah. But I, I, there's just a disconnect that still hasn't all the way come together. Mm-hmm. And he showed the promise he still has in that game. Yeah. And man, they, they, they should have won that. The other exciting thing, though, for this week, we are expected to get C.J. Gardner-Johnson back and Aleem McNeil back. That's huge. Uh, Isaiah Bugs announced he's uh, going away from the team. He's uh, been waived. Yeah. I, I didn't see he was officially cut. Yeah. I saw there was just like a mutual agreement. Yeah. So, I, yeah. so to to bring Gardner-Johnson and Aleem McNeil back, and they're hoping to eventually get James Houston back, um, they still don't know about James Houston. That's a worrying thing to me that he might not even be ready for the first round, um, which stinks. But uh, C.J. Gardner-Johnson and Lee McNeil, hopefully they can get a warm-up game this weekend um, heading for the playoffs, which would be really nice. But, yeah, the, the Lions had to cut Jason Cabinda, Isaiah Bugs, and Bruce Irvin, which I kind of was surprised. I feel like Bruce Irvin in his limited time made some plays. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, so hopefully the defense gets a little healthier, looks a little better. Um, because they did not play C.D. Lamb very well. Listen, Cam Sutton, he's turning into the new Jerry Jacobs. He that 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 play, I believe it was in the fourth quarter, where they had Detroit, they had the Cowboys at like a third and ten or third and eleven, mm-hmm. and Cam Sutton literally wasn't even ready to like. Yes, get, yep. he wasn't even You're like right. in his stance yet. Mm-hmm. He was like looking over, pointing that stuff, not in his stance. Yeah. The play starts and he's just immediately gone. Yeah, immediately burnt. Yeah, like I, I don't understand how you let that stuff happen as a veteran in the NFL. Mm-hmm. It, it's just confusing. Yeah, and that's my only concern going into the playoffs. They need CJ, DJ, for the, stuff like that. The secondary is terrifying because I trust the safeties. We were talking most part. Yeah, but we were talking about it when you look at the NFC. They have. So many burners on wide receiver. Yeah. You have to play potentially Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, 
in the NFC Championship. Probably might see Brandon Cooks, CeeDee Lamb again. Philadelphia has A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith. The Rams have Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua. And even the stinking Tampa Bay Buccaneers have Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. Listen, that rookie from Michigan State on the Packers. Jaden Reed. Jaden Reed is dangerous. He's fun to watch. So they everybody they play has somebody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> everybody yeah. they play. Right. Whereas, like, you look at the AFC, Baltimore. Okay, Zay Flowers. OBJ, eh, sometimes. Miami, definitely dangerous. Cleveland, Amari Cooper, but, you know. If, Shout out to my guy, David Bell. If, He's if, a possession if, receiver, but, yeah. yeah. If Amari Cooper's on the road, he seems to not play as well. The Kansas City Chiefs have the most drops in the NFL. Bracey Rice might be their best receiver right now. He, which, def- yeah. I think he is, easily. Um, Buffalo, Stephon Diggs has been kind of out of the offense lately. Gabe Davis, you know, he can have his games. Their offense just hasn't looked the same. Right. So it's like all these guys that are good schematically against the Lions are in their conference. So they're just going to have to step it up. Again, I'm also hoping that Gardner Johnson steps up and really helps. Um, There might be some weird scenarios where they start playing C.J. Gardner Johnson and uh, Melifonwu together doing different packages and stuff. I hope they get creative with their defensive play call. Outside of Cam Sutton getting grilled for four quarters, the defense played well. Yeah, they did. Yeah, uh, the line got a lot of good pressure. Um, they made some good plays. They got stops when they needed to. Um, they did the thing where you you know, Ceedee Lamb did his thing. He's one of the best receivers in the league. Um, you can only stop him so much, but they got they definitely got torched. But um, they stopped mostly everybody else. So I don't know. Do you have a preference? Who would you rather see, the Rams or the Packers? Honestly, the Rams. And that sounds kind of crazy seeing like the youth of the Packers. Mm-hmm. But I think the Packers would play like they have nothing to lose. Yeah. I think Matt Stafford would have like some weight on his shoulders playing against the Lions mm-hmm. and like having to prove that once again he can do it without Detroit, even though he won a Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah he's he's a few years older after after the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. He has, like, two guys that everybody's looking to stop, Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. Yeah. Even though Kyron Williams has emerged. Yeah. But, see, I think yeah, that's their, – Their defense isn't the same anymore either. I think that's the, the, the thing for me, though, is, like, the Rams lately have been leaning heavily on Kyron Williams. The Lions have stopped every running back this season. Yeah. So, like, that makes me feel good playing yeah. against almost anybody. And th- this is even with Joe Barry looking like one of the worst defensive coordinators in the league Yeah, for the Packers the second half of the season. Mm-hmm. That offense, they're just playing with so much, like, yeah, s- yeah so much swag. I, that, that phrase isn't very popular anymore. Yeah. I'm kind of upset that I said it. They play with a lot of, um, uh, <laughs> I can't think of anything. Hookspa. They play with a lot of panache. <laughs> Let's play panache. That's what we came up with. Yeah. Yep. So, oh my God. either way, it's going to be, I mean, it's either going to be revenge against the Packers, revenge against the Seahawks, revenge against Matt Stafford. Like, there are storylines for the Lions, almost no matter what. So, I think I would just like to take the best one and go with the Rams and just continue with this fun season. Um, I did want to slightly mentioned because we only got a couple minutes to mention the AFC because there's a lot of crazy stuff that could happen in the AFC. The AFC South is still wide open. Jacksonville, Indianapolis, and Houston are all at nine and seven. Jacksonville does have the tiebreaker over Indianapolis and Houston, but if Jacksonville loses the winner of Indy and Houston, because they play each other will be the winner of the AFC South Sunday night football, Miami versus Buffalo is also for the AFC East division. So the AFC can be moved around a lot. Baltimore, Cleveland, Miami's locked into the playoffs, not their position, and Kansas City are all locked into the playoffs. Cleveland locked into the five. Kansas City, I believe, is just locked into the three seed no matter what. Um, So Baltimore, Cleveland, and Kansas City most likely benching all their guys. And Pittsburgh still has a chance to make it in if they beat Baltimore. on. uh, I believe they play on Saturday. I think. Yeah, Steelers and Baltimore play Saturday. Yeah. And the late game, is the late game uh, Colts-Texans? I think so. 
which I'm more interested in that late game because yeah. the division is on the line. Mm-hmm. And, and a wild card spot, potentially. Exactly. Yeah. It's C.J. Stroud versus just I, – I really like what Shane Steichen, especially with Anthony Richardson being out, mm-hmm. what Shane Steichen has done with that team, figuring out how to get – um. Uh oh my God! Who are you thinking of? The Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, figuring out how to like seamlessly put Jonathan Taylor back in mm-hmm. with Gardner Minshew trying to gain chemistry with those young receivers. Yep. I I just I love what he's done in his first year as Colts head coach. Mm-hmm. I like that team a lot. Yeah. And Houston has been kind of a, a darling. Yeah, but team I'm also year. I'm rooting for Nico Collins, the right. Michigan guy. Mm-hmm. Is Tankdale playing? No, he's out for the oh, season. I forgot. I forgot. He yeah. tore his Achilles, didn't mm-hmm. he? Yeah, yeah. I think Houston would have been much more favored if they had Tank Dell as well. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of questionable people on both sides of this game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Texans, Will Anderson, Bernard, Sheldon Rankins, Robert Woods, and Noah Brown all questionable. Mm-hmm. Colts, Kenny Moore, Braden Smith, Quentin Nelson, Ryan Kelly, and Chris Lemons. Yeah. So yeah, there are disadvantages mm-hmm. on both sides. Yeah. So pretty even. But excited it, for that one. Yeah, and it's going to be fun because there's it's it's basically playoff games already starting yeah. for those guys, which will be fun. And like I said, if all of a sudden Buffalo sneaks into the two seed, they might be one of my Super Bowl picks again. I don't know I, why. They draw me in every year. but they, All of their mojo is kind of just fizzled out for me. Yeah, I like, agree. I can see it. Yeah, having James Cook emerge helps a lot, mm-hmm. but that passing game, like what was that against New England? Yeah, <laughs> What was that? It, I, don't I, I don't know, man. Yeah. The other thing that's terrifying for me, personally, um, is that the AFC South winner is basically, is going to get Cleveland. Cleveland, one of the hottest teams in the league right now. And if Cleveland wins that game, they play Baltimore in the second round. I have to go Ravens versus Joe Flacco. Listen, uh, so you, you never thought it would happen. Uh, you got to pick one. Yeah. Are you picking the elite Hall of Famer, Joe Flacco? I don't know. Or are you riding with the purple, the purple birds? I don't know. It's gonna be tough. That that'll be a fun game if it comes to that. Though. MVP quarterback versus the all-time elite Ravens quarterback. That's right. How insane it is is it that Joe Flacco and David Njoku have become like a top five pairing in the second half of the season? Yeah. Like Njoku has emerged because of Joe Flacco. It is football so great. Yeah, I love the sport so. Meanwhile, much. they're. Paying two hundred and fifty million for a guy to sit on the couch. Listen, oh, we're yeah. not, we're not speaking his name while Joe Flacco was having this run. I don't know. We don't speak his name. The other thing that people have pointed out, like I heard Stephen A. Smith talking about it. Imagine if Cleveland didn't lose Nick Chubb to the season. Man, this team would be like Listen, right behind there, the Ravens as favorites. There's a reason by this year and last year in the preseason, I told you and Chris, the Browns are too well coached and too talented overall to be bad. Yeah. Even with like not knowing what's going to come from quarterback, mm-hmm. I just figured the rest of the team was like just so well rounded that something they'd figure it out. Yeah. And they figured it out. And now they found their quarterback. Yeah. They're they, they're having a like uncharacteristic like 80s style Magic Browns run. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen something like this out of Cleveland in my life. Yeah. And like watching old stuff from the Browns when like they had Bernie Kosar, mm-hmm. like they'd have these type of seasons. Yeah. Where they would just go on runs and then disappoint in the playoffs. And that's but why they're going on a run. And that's why people want to see the Lions and the Browns in the Super Bowl. Listen, lowest rated in terms of viewers in football history, but boy, I'm there. It'd be crazy. I'm watching every minute. Two teams that are known for struggling. Yeah. Um, that would be crazy. Um, so that's uh that's basically about it. Next week. What are, what are we gonna do? We're gonna review Michigan's national championship game, winning the national title. Yeah, for the first time in many a years. No negativity. <laughs> it's this. It was meant to be. Yeah, I guess we're gonna preview the NFL playoffs, which I think are gonna be exciting this year. Because yeah, again, I, agree. I think there's a lot of storylines that could happen. Um, we're not gonna talk about the Pistons. They're, they're unless not they win anything. another game. Unless <laughs> a surprise upset, beat the Nuggets. Unless they make a trade or something, we'll see. But uh, it'll probably just be all football um, coming up. But, yeah, this has uh, been Views from the Sidelines, and we'll see you guys next time. Listen, shouts out to Wingstop. <laughs> shouts out to 
Just shouts out to Michigan sports right now. Things are exciting outside of the Pistons. It's, it's a fun time. 